Welcome to the Pretty Powerful Podcast, where powerful women are interviewed every week to share real inspiring stories and incredible insight to help women or anyone break the barriers, be a part of innovation, shatter the glass ceiling, and dominate to the top of their sport, industry, or life's mission. Join us as we celebrate exceptional women and step into our power. And now, here's your host, Angela Gennari. Hello, welcome to the Pretty Powerful Podcast. My name is Angela Gennari, and I am sitting here with Miss Martha Lackritz Peltier. Thank you so much for joining us, Martha. Thank you so much for having me. It's such an honor. Well, this is a pleasure to have you because you have such an incredible resume and I'm super excited for our audience to learn a little bit more about you. So Martha is NGO Sources General Manager. She oversees NGO Sources legal operations and ensures the program's continued alignment with best practices. Martha is deeply engaged in formulating and advocating for more streamlined and localized due diligence processes, similar to the NGO Source model. She is a regular speaker at conferences on topics such as U.S. tax law rules around global giving, due diligence, humanitarian aid, data privacy, and international philanthropy. Martha is also TechSoup's general counsel. Prior to joining NGO Source, Martha worked at a law firm, uh, Adler and Calvin, where she counseled nonprofit and tax exempt organizations and donors with an emphasis on international grant making, advocacy, corporate governance, and charitable solicitation. Prior to this, Martha clerked for the Honorable Chief Justice Wallace Jefferson, interned for Nina Tottenberg at NPR in Washington, D.C., lived in Vietnam under a Fulbright grant and worked as a freelance journalist. Wow, how do you have the time? <laughs> this is amazing. She has authored numerous articles and blog posts on federal law regulations, nonprofit compliance, and international law. Martha holds a bachelor's degree from Brown University and a JD from UC Berkeley Law School. She is a member of both the Texas and California state bars. Martha also was named the 2019 Outstanding Young Nonprofit Attorney by the American Bar Association. In 2020, she was named a Coral Women in Leadership Fellow. In her free time, she volunteers for local nonprofit organizations and is a proud Oakland resident. Wow, what an incredible story. I am so excited. So you have done so much already. Like, it's it's amazing. So let's get started. <laughs> so... How did you get into the nonprofit side of law? That's it's such a unique niche. Yeah, you know, and I have to say, I there are no lawyers in my family. I am oh. um, never would have dreamt that I would become a lawyer. Um, when okay. people ask me, "Oh, is your husband a lawyer?" I'm always like, "God, no! Like one is enough." <laughs> so you know, not not not. I'm, I'm a reluctant lawyer in some way. Um, yeah, but. You know, I was, as you mentioned in my in my bio, I did. Um, I actually studied literature in college. I went um, lived abroad for a number of years and worked as a journalist, and became involved writing about social justice issues. And I and I felt like I had this idea: I'm going to get a master's in creative writing. I'm going to be even more in debt, and yeah. um, and then what am I going to do with it? Um, right. And and I and I at, at some point I decided, well, maybe I'll go to law school because then I can actually approach sort of advocacy and writing with a with a with a with a with a more informed lens you know i can learn about how social justice issues are actually litig litigated and resolved and, and maybe use that skill within in, in a writing career wow so yeah. i i went to law school and had an amazing time because it felt like an intellectual exercise it was never like i need to go to this law firm i need to become a lawyer that it didn't it didn't have any of those expectations um, and then by the time when I graduated, and this was during the, um, this was in 2009, and, and um, the, the, one of the one of the many great recessions, essentially, yeah. um, there was, uh, there weren't a lot of opportunities for me other than going into the law. I think there's this kind of a myth that like, you can do anything with a law degree, or, yeah. or at one point, there was a myth that I had it in my mind. And yeah. really, you're, you're trained to be a lawyer. And so, um, you know, on the one hand, I, I, I loved studying constitutional law. I loved clerking for a justice, but my heart wasn't necessarily in being a traditional lawyer. And so mm. I ended up finding this law firm in San Francisco that is um, the largest firm that is a boutique law firm only practicing nonprofit taxes and law. Um, I happen to know someone who was working there. I reached out. I thought, well, OK, well, this is kind of being a lawyer, but in a way that interests me, that's related to, you know, policy and social justice issues because I'd be working with nonprofits. Um, and so ended up at that law firm and really fell in love with, of all things, 
tax law, a very specific yeah. area of the tax law it's for organizations <laughs> yeah. that don't pay taxes. Right. Um, but yeah, so that's what sort of led me to that. And I, and I haven't regretted it and going in house at, at TechSoup as mm-hmm. an attorney there has continued to sort of feed my desire to do more than just practice law in the traditional sense, but do things all around, um, you know, legal concepts and legal compliance, including things like due diligence and vetting charities, which is a big part of what I do now. Yeah, that's fascinating. Okay. So yeah, so I was loving this as we're reading about all of this and you're interning and you're clerking and you're going to Vietnam, you're you're in Vietnam. And it's just like this incredible amount of experience that you have. And I love that you have this focus on social justice because um, I feel like anyone going into law you you are given such a gift with a law degree to be able to really move the needle and do things in an area that you're passionate about. So that that's just to me, I've always my dream when I was younger was to go to law school and become a prosecutor. And then at one point I had changed it to I think I want to go to law school and maybe you know, work on advocacy on behalf of those who can't speak for themselves, you know, the mm-hmm. environment, children, you know, people who are voiceless in a in a in an arena where money talks. Right. And so I just wanted to be like this, you know, bulldog, badass attorney who just went after, who spoke up for the ones who couldn't speak. And, and that's really what you're doing. Like you really are just helping people through this very confusing world of, you know, giving and charities and nonprofits and, you know, what, what tax implications are there. And, And I love that you're using, you know, your law degree to fuel your passion for the, for social justice. So amazing. Good for you. Thank you. And well said. Yeah. I think it, you know, if one has the privilege of, of going to law school, it's an expensive endeavor. It's a, mm. it's a major, you know, it's a, it's three years of your life. I think yes. that one, you know, one has to be privileged to be able to even do that. And then I yes. think you have a kind of an obligation, you know, yeah. I, even if one, you know, even if one's full-time job is not you know, in the nonprofit sector, or the public sector, you know, there are reasons that attorneys are highly encouraged to do pro bono work and pay annual, you know, contributions to access to justice, you know, within the state bars. But anyway, I, yeah, well, good. I'll come off my soapbox. We're aligned. Oh no, no, it's good. Get on your soapbox. This is the, this is the platform. <laughs> this, is, this is the audience you want to share it with. Um, because I think we're all on the same page here. Um, so, so tell me a little bit, what made you go into tax law, um, specifically and, and how is it, you know, what are the implications of tax law when it comes to nonprofits? Because, you know, like you were, like you kind of just touched on it's, it's an industry that really doesn't pay taxes. So, you know, it's, it's confusing. Yeah. Obviously. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, I have trouble doing my own taxes, so I'm, yeah. I'm, I, it seems odd to call myself a tax lawyer. You know, I think it's what's interesting is, you know, why is it that the tax code governs organizations that don't pay taxes? Yeah. And the reason is you have to jump through a lot of hoops in order to not pay taxes. And so yeah. there's this whole set of regulations around any kind of organization, whether it's a, a charity, a foundation, um, a labor union, a trade association, a civic league. You know, there are all kinds right. of nonprofit organizations that are not your traditional charities that don't pay taxes. Um, a PAC, you know, political groups, right? These are all different kinds of organizations that don't pay taxes. And so in order to even be recognized to that extent and maintain that tax exempt status, there's a whole set of rules and chapters and chapters in the tax code that say, this is what you can do. This is what you can't do if you're going to do this and you have to also do this, right? Mm. And so that's where, you know, as a tax exempt lawyer, um, my interest was in, there is something that I like about the tax code, which is, uh, there's lots of gray areas, but there's a lot of black and white, you know, there's, yeah. there are tons of rulings. There's a lot of, yeah. there's a, there, you can, it, I, I think it is an area of the law where, and I probably will have a tax lawyer telling me, what are you talking about? It's so nuanced <laughs> and difficult because of course it is. <laughs> right. On the other hand, it, it, you know, there, there are pieces of it that are very satisfying that are, that are almost logical and delineated so clearly, because when you take tax and lawyer, lawyers and, and accountants and bring them together, you get like <laughs> way more detail than one would ever need. Right. <laughs> um, and so, you know, I, I think there is a beauty in that, but I, but I think, you know, having counsel that can help organizations understand, like, how do we make sure that we don't lose that tax exempt status? What are the steps we have to do? Are we allowed to go out and lobby Congress for a change for something that we care about, or are we not? And, you know, are we, if we, if we make a grant, are we allowed to, you know, say that they, the recipient um, or receive a contribution, can we tell the recipient they have a, they can take a tax deduction or not, right? I mean, there's just a myriad number of laws that that work around that. 
my, you know, within taxes and law, there are also lots of specialties, right? There are attorneys that specialize in advising the the grant makers themselves. There are attorneys mm. that specialize in advising, you know, political groups, say, um, social welfare organizations. Um, and by focusing on international philanthropy as a particular niche area, I, I, you know, I going back to this social justice idea is that I, I have this enormous privilege of working with a vast array of organizations doing amazing things around the world, yeah. and and have this this small sort of behind the scenes role and helping to make sure that that keeps working and they keep getting the resources that they need in a way that isn't particularly sexy, but mm-hmm. I find endlessly fascinating and incredibly important, right? It's, yeah. it's, it's, it's the paperwork and dotting the I's and, um, you know, sometimes people don't care until you get audited and you realize, oh my God, I, I guess some of these bills are important. So, yeah. you know, it's fun. I think um, it's, it's nerdy fun, the, mm-hmm. the work I do, but it's also satisfying because of the exposure I get. I get to see organizations fighting for trans rights in East Africa and organizations working on, you know, First Amendment issues in Eastern Europe. And I mean, just the yeah. whole gamut of people that are passionate about what they're doing. Yeah. And I get to just sort of see that and be around it and, and you know, help them do the things that that they're amazing at all the things they do, but they don't know the little text rules. And, and then that's mm. where I can come in and say, oh, I can help you on this. Yeah, that's amazing. Well, good. So tell me a little bit more about what NGO Source is, because uh, is that part of TechSoup or not part of TechSoup? Yeah, it's a great question. So it is a program of TechSoup. It was okay. launched in um, 2013. Um, it was initially the Council on Foundations, which is this U.S. sort of tr- trade group almost. It's a charity okay. of of grant makers within the U.S. They come together and they talk about things like how can we make giving more fair and transparent and equitable and how can we help each other and our grantees. And they had identified in 2008 that there was this tax law compliance issue that was it, costing tons of money in duplication Um, And they wanted to figure out a way to make it more streamlined. Um, And so they put together an RFP in 2008, along with a bunch of other funders saying, we're looking for a charity that will house a repository of vetted nonprofits um, that multiple funders can go in and access. And so the idea was, you know, right now, you know, funder, you know, X foundation, B foundation, D foundation, we all want to give to this charity in Ukraine. Yeah. Um, and each of us has our own vetting process and each of us reaches out to that charity and each of us says, we need you to do this. We need you to do this. We need a copy of your board ma- documents. We need your financial policies. You need to-. And the, the charity in Ukraine, say, is doing it three different times for uh-huh. three different funders. Right. And it's using a ton of their time. The funders are each hiring their own attorneys and so they're paying their own attorneys to it. And so the, the idea was, how can we create a unified repository housed within a charity itself so that it doesn't become a commercial tool that can be used to sort of, you know, get, get fun, money out of people only. Right. Um, and, and and to house and maintain a repository over the years that will become, you know, large enough that multiple funders can come to it and pay w- really a fraction of the price and the organizations on the other end of it are only having to go through the exercise once. And mm. so that was sort of the birth of the NGO source program. TechSoup responded to the RFP, they received it, and then spent the next five years um, building it, working with the Treasury to make sure that we had um, the compliance mechanisms in place, that it would be acceptable to them, because the idea of a, of a unified repository that could reutilize vetted organizations was new. Yeah. Um, and so that was how NGOs Force was born out of TechSoup. So we're very much a program of TechSoup. Um, because it is a program based on due diligence tax law standards, the vetting that we issued are actually legal opinions. Um, as general counsel of TechSoup, I also manage that program because of its sort of legal function. Um, it yeah. was initially also it really drew me to TechSoup. I was I was uh, the program was is very well regarded, and when I left private practice to join TechSoup, it was really to be a part of NGO Source. So um, it is a big part of of what I do as as general counsel. Awesome. So NGO, um, just so people understand, it's non governmental organization, correct? And so it's basically how nonprofits are referred to internationally. Am I on the right track? Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for so, clarifying that. Yeah. Yeah. Because it was confusing to me when I started reading about NGOs because I'm like, well, I, I don't understand what an NGO is, but really it's, it's just how everyone refers to uh, a nonprofit around the world, except for the U S kind of like the metric for system versus. Yeah. <laughs> so it's, yeah, you know, it's, we it's have true, our yeah. own verbiage for everything, but, um, but NGO is really, uh, it's, it's a nonprofit organization. So, well, um, and it's interesting too, because Often they are very connected to the government, yeah. right? I mean, mm-hmm. there are nonprofits that get tons of government grants, but it's, yes. it is interesting because I think there's a sense of like, no, we we need to be seen as separate to be sort of pure. But but it's all, you know, it's. Yeah. I, I think it's very blended. There, what we often like to say now, since since you raised it, is civil society, um, right. because civil society really does incorporate 
you know, you know, if you think of a group like Black Lives Matter, who was actually yeah. not an incorporated entity because they didn't, they chose not to be incorporated because they uh -huh. wanted to make, you know, for whatever the reasons are. And the point is, so what do you call that? Is it not a nonprofit? It's civil society because they're serving a public good. And there are tons of examples of that all over the world where, you know, another example is, say, in a country where they have um, very, you know, anti-humanitarian laws, or they are, don't allow, don't have LGBTQ rights, and an organization fighting for LGBTQ rights cannot actually register as an NGO because they would be formally recognized, right? So you have this right. whole spectrum of, of civil society. Um, within that, NGOs is the commonly used term. Okay, very cool. So, you know, my first real uh, glimpse into the international NGO world was many years ago, I read a book called Half the Sky. Have you ever heard of this book? No. So half I'm the sky, I know. <laughs> so half the sky was written by two New York Times um, writers who would travel around the world and bring back these international stories of, you know, um, how do I say this? Very small organizations or one one person who's doing something to really change their community, really. So it was really like a, a kind of a kind of a grassroots organization that's just kind of putting themselves out there. You have one woman who had been, you know, sex trafficked her whole life and she's decided she was going to fight back and save these children who are being sex trafficked. And so she has her own little, very small organization that's saving lives. And so it's her story. And then it's somebody's story in India who was, you know, a uh, uh, who was uh, burned, you know, because a lot of the women, mm. if, they, if they're if they caught, you know, having any kind of affair or something like that, they will throw uh, acid or, or something and, and burn mm. them. So they call it bride burning. And they, they have, uh, you know, in Africa, there's multiple, and most of it is women, you know, who have, who are mm. started these organizations and it's, it's fighting for women's rights. And the reason it's called Half the Sky is there is a, I think, and, and I'm, I apologize, I know I'm slaughtering this entire description but basically it's it's a there's a proverb in china and it says women hold up half the sky right and so it's just the importance of women oh. and, and so they would bring back these stories to the new york times and the new york times was not publishing them and they were getting so frustrated mm. and they're like yeah you know it's not financial it's not this it's not this and they just thought nobody cared nobody cares what's happening in some small village in africa nobody cares what's happening in you know some very poor area of india nobody cares mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. and they were saying like these stories need to be heard like they're are people out there doing really, really incredible things? Why aren't we telling their stories? And so the reason I'm bringing this up is because you know if if you wanted to, because in the in the time that I was reading this, I was like, why aren't we doing something? Like you know, it lit a fire, and I'm like, we need to go save these women. <laughs> and and but they have yeah. a list of the the organizations, but I don't even know the very first. You know, I don't even know where to start in terms of like donating to them. How do I give to them? Do I is this a tax deduction? Is it not a tax deduction? It's international. I don't even know where to go. You know, so you're dealing with very small organizations. It's not like you're given giving to mm -hmm. this large global organization these are small community organizations mm -hmm. and you know, how do you even start and so that's a question for you now yes no Angela I I love I love this question I love this story I'm going to find this book I uh -huh. you said it so you know this really touches on something that is a big part of what I'm working on now which is a which is a due diligence program that is focused on small grassroots organizations that are delivering yeah. resources on the ground. Yes. So it, this is what you say is, is even, you know, um, a microcosm of, of, of the bigger picture of major development funders, right? If you look at like a USAID or, you know, yeah. the, the European Union or United Nations who are making grants, they have so many restrictions on the funds. They have so many, so many due diligence requirements that the okay. only possible grant recipients of those funds are the Red Crosses and the Oxfams, which are fabulous organizations, right? Sure. But the very yeah. large, sophisticated international NGOs. And those are the only organizations really eligible to be receiving funds. And by the same token, are the only ones that are sort of visibly out there for individual donors, right? We, we hear um, about a disaster or a crisis. Right. And it's kind of like their top three organizations that we, we want to give to because we, we trust them or because we've heard their name and, you know, right. um, but in reality, and, and this is, a, and again, I want to, I want to be really clear that this is not 
it, it isn't because those international NGOs are bad or wrong or, or being, you know, sure villainous or hiding the funds. But ultimately, you know, the, the actors on the ground, those local actors, those small groups, those grassroots actors, those individual those community organizations who are there all the time, not just during the time of a disaster, right? Those are right. the ones who are actually delivering the goods, who are actually serving those communities, who understand those communities, and they're right. totally invisible. Yeah. And in terms of the, the funds, um, you know, studies have shown that it's less than 2% of the total funds that are granted from foundations and from governments are, are is actually reaching them. Again, wow. not, not because of bribery or corruption. It's yeah. insane. And, uh, but, but really because of these um, kind of compliance requirements is a huge part of it because sure. everybody has to shoulder a little bit of the liability. So you have this giant international NGO that says, we'll take this $10 million grant, we will process it, which is complicated. And they have to make sure they have all their lawyers looking at it. And then yeah. they give it to their sub grantee who is at a regional level, who then does all of their processing. And they also need to take a part of those sums because it has sure. to pay for all of the work that they're doing, who then blah, 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 so on and on until the bottom of the chain. And, and there needs to be a way for both individual donors, but also governments who give these multi-million and billion dollar grants to be able to just give those funds directly to the groups on the ground. Right. So right. the program that, that I've been really involved in for the past few years, which is which is a, sort of an offshoot of NGO source at TechSoup, is, is how do we solve this problem using due diligence? Right. And so we're developing this program, which is let's go find all of those not all of those, but many local actors and local yeah. organizations who are delivering services. And let's put them through, let's 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 sort of vet them. Let's determine do they meet the kind of requirements that donors are asking for, whether it's an individual donor who may have very few requirements. You know, we just want to know that you're a legitimate organization. Sure. To, you know, USAID who needs them to sign 50 different certifications and have 10 different procurement policies and all of these yeah. processes in place. We're, we're, we're putting them through a sort of a vetting process to see, do you have this? Do you have this? Do you have this? Do you have this? And then we go back to them and we say, this is where you're really strong. This is where donors are going to look for additional evidence. And then we're going to connect you with the resources that can help you get those. And yeah. so this program that we're calling, we call it STEP, um, is about, it's, it's two tiered. One is creating a repository of vetted mm -hmm. organizations specifically focused on small grassroots local organizations in the global South. But the second right. aspect of it is how do we then use that vetting process to immediately resource them with the tools and the compliance processes they need so that the next time a donor comes to them, they can say, oh, yeah, actually, we do have a policy that covers, you know, how we handle, how we distribute cash, right? Yeah, and they're yeah. able to check those boxes and start becoming visible to those big funders. Because one of the things we're finding is that, you know, this problem that I'm talking about, about, you know, less than 2% of the funds getting to the ground people know, you know, I mean, the United yeah. Nations is aware of this problem and, and funders are with and they want to get around it, but even they don't know how to do it, right? Wow. They're like, we, we know that this is what's happening. We don't know how to reach them. We don't know how to give them funds. We don't know how to, so a lot of work needs to be done, but I think that there is, a, I think just the difficulty of, of all of the layers of compliance and risk management that, that we put on the transferring of funds, which have really grown over the years in particular since 9-11 because we have all these yeah. anti-terrorist regulations, right? Of like, course. like there's a good reason why we want to make sure we know what you're doing with that money, yes. right? Yes. Um, particularly in war-torn and conflict zones where it's even mm. more, you know, potentially likely that those funds could be abused. So yeah. it's kind of trying to break through all of those, all of that red tape. Again, not delegitimizing it or not not saying it isn't important. We're still, you know, trying, we're trying to build up the compliance of those smaller organizations, build some transparency into the process so that they actually know how to comply and become, can become more eligible for those funds. So yeah. that, you know, these, you know, in this half, half the sky narrative that you were talking about, those groups can actually be visible to funders and, and, yeah. and build up their compliance and their capacity for, to receive larger kinds of resources. Oh, that's amazing. Okay. So yeah, because one of the big things that they talk about in this book is the reason that a lot of these uh, grassroots organizations exist is because some of these smaller communities don't trust big organizations. And so the people who are actually getting the work done, like you might have the UN come in or some big organization come in, but it's on such a, uh, it, it's not at the scale where they're connecting with the real true people who need the money. Right. And so mm -hmm, like they're doing mm -hmm. something on a larger scale, but it is so I don't know, can I say sanitized, you know, where, yeah, yeah, where they're like not you. really getting in there and, and getting into the nitty gritty of what needs to happen, you know, saving lives and getting out there and, you know, like, sure, they'll do the, you know, 
Doctors Without Borders and, and all of these really great organizations, and I'm not discounting them at all. But when you have someone who is, you know, physically taking a young girl out of a house um, who is being sex trafficked and, you know, kind of kidnapping her away and bringing her back to her family, like, you know, a lot of big organizations aren't touching that, you know, they're not, they're not touching that. It's too risky. Yeah. You know, so it's these, it's these grassroots organizations. It's these really small ones who are connected in their communities. You have to know what's going on. They're not, you know, these, these doors aren't open to everybody. You know, this is, this is a very small community of people who know what's happening behind the scenes and they're doing something to, to make a difference in people's lives, but they also may not have the sophistication and the resources to make it to these larger organizations to say, Hey, we need help, you know? And so yeah, that's, yeah. that's the part that there's the huge disconnect because the people who really are making all the difference don't necessarily have a team of attorneys and they don't necessarily have a team of grant writers and, and people who are backing them. I mean, cause you know, and similar mm -hmm. to what I say about entrepreneurs, sometimes we get so busy working in our business that we forget to work on our our business and it's the same thing mm -hmm. you know it's the same mm -hmm. thing with a nonprofit. Mm -hmm. absolutely if you're out there and your goal is to really change lives and to do something really significant you may not even really consider yourself a nonprofit. you know you need resources but you don't consider yourself an organization as much as i just need money to be able to save you know these 10 more victims i need housing i need food i need resources i need medical care and you don't know where to go because, you know, at the end of the day, you don't have that kind of um, platform foundation to be able to reach back out to and say, hey, look, this is where we need help. And you don't have you know, necessarily the connections to do that. So yeah, I love absolutely. that you're trying to reach them. I love that we're, there's, there's a plan in place to reach them. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a long way to go. I, you know, I think the other mm -hmm. thing is when we talk about... Um, you know, the, working, working on their mission. I, I, I mean, completely. I mean, people that are out there working in their communities, understandably are not wanting to get in front of a computer and spend their whole day <laughs> responding to a compliance questionnaire. Right. Right. And, 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 uh, and, and, you know, you have a limited set of resources and you want to put those resources into going down into the field and doing something. Yeah. And by the same token, when you do have a donor, there's their donors aren't going in and saying, we want to pay for you to get an attorney to, yes. we want to pay for you to clean up your paperwork. No, <laughs> we want to pay for the orphanage that you're building. You yeah. know, we want to pay for the, the scholarships for the kids. Right. Right. And so I think, you know, a, a program that actually does walk them through, we're going to give you these resources. We're going to yeah. help you figure out how to do this so that you don't have to try to figure it out yourself is also because that that very exercise in and of itself is is rarely funded. Um, yeah. So, you know. Mm -hmm. Well, I love that. So so what is the UN Grand Bargain? Can you tell me a little bit about that? Yeah. And, you know, this talks very directly about the issue that I was talking about, about funds being trickled down. Um, so this was a group of funders, and it was the largest funders internationally, who in 2016, and it included um, uh, most of the UN agencies, uh, several very large private funders like the Gates Foundations and other other known funders who came okay. together in 2016 and sort of said, we have lots of problems happening with, with global philanthropy and humanitarian aid. And how can we work together to fix these? Wonderfully noble idea. They came together with a set of commitments. It was signed by all of these funders. And over the years, more signatories have joined. Signatories have joined. And one of their major commitments was, now again, this was in 2016, was by 2020, we want 25% of all funds going directly to local actors. Wow. Um, so as I was saying before, like this is a known problem. And and right. powerful resourced groups were coming to get are coming together and have come together to say we want to solve this. And here we are in 2022, and we're no again, we're at about two percent. We're not anywhere near 25 percent. So, mm -hmm. you know, and, and that's and they're continuing to work toward it. And the grand bargain is, you know, a group that continues to grow and add signatories and to revise sort of how they can meet that plan. So continues to have an incredibly noble mission. Um, but but really this this is I think, you know, it's 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 a little bit of a failure of the grand bargain right now that needs to be sort of re-envisioned, and maybe it was too ambitious, but you know, I think it's incredibly important that that was called out and that it was sort of these groups came together to say, this is a problem we need to fix. I think yeah. we still don't really know how to get there, apparently, right. you know? Right. I mean, so mm -hmm. the intention is good, but the execution is where it's lacking, right? So yeah, yeah. Intentions versus execution. I think that's, that's a, a huge factor in every business, right? Like we can all Absolutely. go in with good intentions, but it's all in the execution. So 
So tell me a little bit more about tax law, U.S. tax laws related to global giving. If I were to donate to an NGO, let's just say in a small village in Africa, how do I how do I write that off? How do I how do I put that in in my tax statement? Is that is that a donation? Is it not a donation? Is it a write off? Like how how do you even manage? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. I mean, and that's another tricky thing I think is is tax deductibility rules make it certainly, you know, push us to give in certain areas, which is perfectly understandable. If you're not going to pay tax on a donation, then the U.S. wants you to make that donation to a charity in the States. Um, so I think that there are, so, you know, it's much easier to determine if you're giving it to a, a recognized 501c3 organization in right. the U.S. If it's outside of the U.S., there are a few ways to do this. Um, I think one of the, you know, just in the past 10 or 15 years, the rise of these kind of global giving type groups that operate and donor advised funds. Um, Network for Good is a great example of you can go onto a website and essentially they are acting as um, a, you know, they operate donor advised funds, which is a tax law mechanism in which they are themselves a charity. You uh-huh. can, you make a donation to them and then, and you are essentially making a recommendation that they make that grant to a third party. And oh, so what happens is, yeah, you're still giving, you're giving to a, um, a 501c3 nonprofit in the U.S. Um, right. You are strongly recommending that they give that to a third party that you are naming. Uh-huh. As a legal matter, they have the right to say, nah, we're not going to, right? Uh-huh. Um, we're actually, but that's not going to happen because that's a business model that no one is going to want to give to. Um, right, right. But, but, in pra- but what they actually have to do is, okay, we understand that you want to give that charity in India. We now have to do due diligence to figure out whether it is actually appropriate to give to that organization. And so we'll accept the liability for if it's not a charity, say, and we'll make the donation. You get a tax donation, even for a $5 gift or a $5,000 sure. gift. Um, and then we regrant it on your behalf. It's, it's, it's a great tool. You know, donor advice funds have been growing immensely. Um, and, and what a lot of people don't realize is I think when you hear about donor advice funds, you think of the large financial institutions like Fidelity and Charitable who have, who you have very wealthy donors who can create donor advice funds to move their charitable gifts. Right. Um, but it's also functions in for very small donations. Like I said, Network for Good is a very commonly known tool, which people might not realize there are many donor advice funds. It relies on the exact same tax, tax function. Another great way to give internationally is with local community foundations. Okay. So every, um, you know, most communities have most states and most regions and many cities, right, have their, whether it's the San Francisco Community Foundation or the Boston Community Foundation or um, Silicon Valley Community Foundation is, is the largest one in the states. Um, they also operate donor advised funds. So that's another great way to give. You're giving locally. A small percentage of that goes within to your community because they're a community foundation that serves the community. And then they also will often regrant internationally. Um, and mm-hmm. community foundations are a big, they u- do use NGO source quite a bit because the vetting service that we provide does allow them to uh, rely on our vetting so that if you go to your, you know, Oklahoma community foundation and you say, I really want to give to this Indian orphanage, yeah. um, they go to NGO source, they have us do the vetting of that entity. And then they can say, great, somebody else has vetted this for us already. It's in their repository. Um, and so, you know, I think this, this idea of NGO source this repository of vetted organization that really does sort of have this ripple effect of it's not just the big foundations that rely on us, but it's the donor advice funds who are then able to open up international giving to their clients as individual donors, um, you know, to the United Ways of the World Employee Giving mm-hmm. Groups, groups like that, um, yeah. use, use NGO source as well. It is a single organization that is getting these um, vetted certifications, but it's enabling all of these individual donors to then be able to give to their local community foundation or donor advice fund and get a tax deduction. Interesting. Okay. Fascinating. So is, let's just say I wanted to open the the gate and say, I want to donate to this organization because they're doing some really great work in, you know, Thailand, right? And so I decide I'm going to send a check to an organization in Thailand. I send them money. Are there any concerns as far as data privacy, anything like that, that you should be concerned about when it comes to international giving? Yeah, what a great question. You know, um, Obviously, it varies widely from country to country. Sure, um, sure. One of the things that people might not realize is in certain countries, giving to an entity could actually cause problems for the recipient. And I'm not I'm not saying to discourage giving, but sure, sure. You know, I'll use China as an example, um, which in 2016, China passed a very comprehensive, um, it's called the ONGO law, the basically overseas NGO law, which, mm. which was really a, one effort to sort of control who receives gifts from outside the U.S., right? They didn't want to see tons of money going into human rights groups that could potentially oppose the government, right? And so um, 
this law essentially said any organization within nonprofit organizations within China that's receiving funds from abroad has to be, they can't even receive those funds if they aren't registered with us, right? Wow. So this is an extreme example of a government really trying to control the kind of activity that civil society undergoes, um, but doing it in a way that um, really does stifle philanthropy. And now th mm. those are rare cases, but I'll just sure. call out that, you know, uh, worth uh, even just a Google search, like, are there laws against receiving nonprofit, you know, you know, in, in a certain country, you know, Thailand, for example, does not have those. But yeah. It's all good to give in Thailand. Um, so, so there's one, I think the consequences that could come to the organization is worth um, calling out. I think the other thing I would point out is, um, you know, it, I would only give to an organization with whom someone has some understanding or credibility, whether it's, I, you know, however that may be, whether it's yeah. an individual, maybe you were on a, on a trip somewhere and you interacted with them. However sure. it is, like, I think having that assurance is important because it is important to note that we do have these anti-terrorism regulations. And right. if you end up giving to someone and it turns out they're a terrorist, you could go to prison. Right. right. So, yeah. <laughs> um, you know, so feel somewhat confident that you're not going to be a terrorist. You know, I think right. there are those, those kind of, um, again, these are rare situations. I'm not trying to raise too many red flags. Other than that, I think, you know, um, best practices where one would use in, any time that they're wiring funds, right? You're mm. not going to want to share too much confidential information. Best to go through financial institutions. You know, typically wiser to give to an organization as opposed to an individual's bank account. Sure. Um, although having said that, lots of situations where an organization isn't able to access a bank account, right? I mean, it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's very tricky. Um, I also think, you know, depending on how much you're giving, um, okay, you know, maybe I just gave $5 to somebody who totally scammed me on the street. Right. I think I can live with it. Do you know what I mean? Like, I right, think, right, and, right. And maybe you're giving $50 to a charity that you believe in and there's a small chance that maybe it's not real and maybe that's okay. And maybe you just go on living your life. And you know what I mean? I think there's a huge nuance right. there. And, and, sure. I, and, and, I, and I'm not trying to scare people away from giving, which is what I'm worried is will end up being conveyed. But I, but I, I wouldn't think, you know, more than those basic, okay, I'm transferring funds abroad, the yeah. same steps that you might take in any other situation where you're transferring funds to another country. Okay. Very good. Awesome. All right. Well, good advice. So, um, and, and I'm a big believer also in volunteering. So I, 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 you know, not just, you know, sending money, but time, I feel like time is our most valuable resource, way more important than money sometimes. Yeah. And, um, but yeah, putting time in is, is important too. So I, I'm a, I am a fan of anybody who's putting themselves in a position to help others. And I love what you're doing. I think that's so amazing. So Kudos to you for spending your career devoted to serving others. I love that so much. So, oh, well, thank you. Yes, absolutely. So what what uh what would you tell your 18-year-old self? Oh god. What advice would you give to 18-year-old you? I mean, there's so much advice I want to give, right? Like right? what would I not say? Um, <laughs> no. You know, I um this is one of those things that maybe you can only get with age, right? But right. like confidence is so much more important than anything else. Yes. Like I, it, and, and that's one of the, like, you can't tell someone to have, be confident, right? You have, they have to get there, but why does it take us and particularly women, right? Yeah. I mean, I think we spend so much of our lives and some of us, our entire lives mm -hmm. so focused on what people think of us, yep. what we look like. Yep. Um, and, and all of the rest is kind of a nice to have, right? Like, sure. um, it, and, and, and then you realize at a certain age, like, no, actually none of that does really matter. But like being confident and, and caring about yourself and loving yourself, like everyone feels that around you, right? That, right. that's what, that's what moves people. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I, I just feel, uh, and again, I think this is all, all women, I mean, all, all people, I don't, but in particular women, yeah, um, right. I think the insecurities that we, and enable in us and that society enables and that just fuel everything we do in ways that we think about what we could do if we were able to release those insecurities sooner oh my gosh lives. oh you know? yes absolutely but you know it's funny um so and that that's a great segue and it's my next question so as women we often give our power away we so often you know we we give credit to somebody else when we did all the work you know or or we compliment somebody for something that yeah, you know, it's probably due to us, but, you know, we give them the credit or we allow somebody to take our power away. You know, we we allow mm -hmm. somebody to criticize us or do something that was just so unwarranted and we don't stand up for ourselves. So, I mean, so often in, in life, we give our power away. And I think that it's not unique to only women, for sure. 
but I think by and large, we do it much more frequently than men do. So tell me about a time that you gave your power away and then another time that you stepped into your power. And what was the difference between those, those times? Yeah. You know, as you're talking, it, it reminds me, so I grew up, um, I, 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 you know, it was funny. I'm sure a lot of us saw that the, there was a Facebook meme a few years ago, and I'm sure it's much older than that, which is, you know, um, stop calling little girls bossy instead oh. say, you know, you're like a CEO or something. Yeah, like yeah, that, yeah, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and and my my brother forwarded it to me and said something like, <laughs> my, my sister's been a CEO since she came out of the womb. You know what I mean? Like, uh, yep. Um, in a way, right? But it was like, but I think um, I, and this goes back to like by looking at one's former self, sure. I, I spent, I would say like the first 10 to 12 years of my life being very outspoken. And, yeah. and literally I was like, I will be the first female president. And I, you know what I mean? And, and, yeah. then, and, and then spending, I would say most of my teenage years trying to push that down and trying yeah. to be like, Oh no, this isn't, this isn't appropriate. This is not, nobody likes this. No, you know, yeah. um, this is, yeah. I'm not, you're not supposed to be the smartest one in the room. You're not mm -hmm. right. Um, and I, and I think that profoundly changed my personality that took me years to, to sort of yeah. find my true self. <laughs> Yes, um, I know. Mm -hmm. Totally and, relate. And so it's more of a, I'm sure, right? I think this is, I I, mm -hmm. I, I love talking to women about this because it's always like, yes. <laughs> um, yeah. But, um, you know, I, I think I it was only very recently that I started like using the word ambition or like encouraging other women to use the word ambition and to just say like, you're ambitious. And then to say like, you know, because I say, how do I say I really want to succeed, but I don't want And I'm like, you're ambitious. And that's yeah. a good thing. Yeah. Like that's yeah. not a bad word. It's not right. bad to be ambitious, right? Um, so again, I, I'm I'm totally skirting your question by not giving a specific instance, but, but I'm thinking more generally about how it, it wasn't until, you know, it, it, well into my 30s that I think I, I realized like, oh yeah, I, I was this person and, I, and I'm and i only now coming back yep. to, be, to become that person again. So in a way, I felt like I really gave away my power for most of my teenage years, as many girls do. Yes. Um, and, mm -hmm. and, and I feel... And I'm so happy. Like I love, I, I have such a great place in my life in my forties and I'm, and I'm loving it. And I'm yep. like, I aging, aging is amazing. Like I have yeah. no interest in being in my twenties again because of all of the reasons <laughs> that we're talking about. Yes. Um, because I am stepping, I, I reclaim that power. I'm like, mm -hmm. oh no, that's, this is who I am. Yeah. And not only, not only do people appreciate this, I appreciate this. I yeah. like this, you know? Mm -hmm. so. mm -hmm. No, I love it. I love it. And you're so right, because I think that that happens and, and we don't really even step back into our power for a long time, because I remember, you know, I was always very driven, outspoken, you know, like I, I was, I needed to be the best in the room at all things. And then realized in my teenage years, like you, you know, it's like, oh, well, boys don't like it when you, when you beat them at things and when you're smarter than they are and, you know, when you're more driven than they are. And, you know, and so I think all the way, all the way through my twenties, you know, I even sadly got married when I was trying to be that, you know, I'm going to meet you in the middle and be that happy medium and, you know, bring down the tone and bring down, you know, my ambition. And I'm just going to, you know, softly walk in that. And then it was like in my mid thirties, I was like, this is not who I freaking am. You know, like this mm -hmm. is not who I am. And then oh, yeah, it, it relationship. Became, yeah, it became really clear that um, I could stay in the marriage and be who I wasn't or, you know, be who I really am and be happy. And, you know, that's kind of where I'm at yeah. now. So, <laughs> so, yeah. But yeah, so, but yeah, it's, it, it's hard because we do, you're so right. I mean, we, we really do come to a realization in our, in our, you know, teenage years when, when insecurity hits that like, Oh wait, I'm not supposed to be this way. And boy, I tell yeah. you, nothing can ruin you more than being somebody you're not or trying to pretend yeah, like yeah. you're not ambitious and you're not successful and you're not smart, you know? So mm -hmm. I love that. I love that. So who inspires you? Mm. Who inspires me? Gosh, so many people. This is super corny, but it's honestly the first person that came to mind is my yeah. mother. Oh. Um, you know, and, and I think, um, and, and she's just, I, because she's kind, you yeah. know, I mean, I, I think it's kindness that I think, you know, it is, it, we talk about being ambitious and, and bossy and, 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 and I think that the perfect pair to that is, 
also being humble and kind, yes. right? Like, it, which, which is so possible. I think that's the thing is, um, again, talking about ambitious being a bur- dirty word as though if you're ambitious, it also means that you're unkind or you're relentless or you're competitive yeah. and Cut I'm really none of yeah. those things. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so, so I think that, you know, um, and, and loving me and believing in me and, and, you know, doing the same for my granddaughter and, you know, just, I yeah. mean, her granddaughter, not right, my granddaughter. Right. Not, so say you're not too young. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so, you know, I, 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 she's a huge inspiration to me. I mean, um, yeah, I think, you know, more generally, like all of the mentors I've ever had in my life and in women particularly, but including men, like, you know, um, yeah, the, good, the, the good male mentors who were like, you know, who stood up for me, who could be um, more than just mentors, but advocates. Yes. Because often, you know, there's, there is this great article. It's, um, I think it's called women are over mentored and under sponsored. Yeah. And talk about how we have lots of, we have lots of mentors, but often um, the women who are mentoring us have never, haven't gotten to the position of power where they can also actually advance us in a way. So sometimes it helps to have a sponsor who is someone who is in that most powerful position who could then say, Oh no, this is the person I want to speak to. Right. So, you know, I I think all all of the mentors and the sponsors and the advocates, um, I, I, Again, I feel like I'm giving you really broad answers because I don't have a single. It's a very single... journey of you. <laughs> I <kidding>. know, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, I love it. I love it. No, you're right because I think um, you know it's one thing to it's one thing to advise and to mentor, but it's a whole other thing to really advocate for, right? And sometimes yeah. women just aren't in a position to advocate for other women, but men are. And you know, yeah. I applaud those men who step up and say, "Yes, we're advocating for this woman because she deserves this seat at the table," right? Absolutely. And so, yeah. I love it. Yeah, Yeah, absolutely. Can't cannot agree more. So I've really enjoyed this conversation. I have one more question for you. What do you wish more people knew? Mm. Wow. What do I, what is another really great question? (laughs) Huh? What do I wish more people knew? Um, You really stumped me on this one. <laughs> and it's just, you know, I, yeah, I mean, I feel like this is going to be cliched and corny again, but, um, I, so I have been incredibly fortunate to spend a lot of time in other parts of the world, um, mm. in places where, um, I was the outsider. And I think, um, you know, being, being white in America, often we, we don't have that experience. Right. Sure. Um, and going to a country where um, no one looks like you and everyone stares at you and you're always going to be an outsider. Like you can't hide it. You know what I mean? Of course. Um, is, is, is an, is an incredible experience in terms of putting yourself in other people's shoes. Um, mm. And, and I feel like it's something that many people don't ever get to experience. And I think that we do have a major lack of empathy and understanding um, around the world of other yeah. people. Right. And, and, and a lot of it is just because we have never had that experience and I think maybe if if if, if I, I wish people knew that like everyone has been in your shoes before, everyone that you encounter has been in your position, you've been in their position in some way before, right? Right. And it's so easy for us to, and I do this myself as well, to 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 you know to sort of villainize other people or to or to see somebody as an other and just think there's we have nothing in common or we would never, you know, right. and and that's just not the case, you know, like right. we we really are right. all human. Yeah. Um, and, and even people who have ideas that are totally distasteful to us, they have also slipped in the shower and they also probably have a mother that they love or a child that they love or a dog that they love. And, yeah. you know, there is, we do have this commonality that we're increasingly losing. I think the, uh, even while we're able to travel and interact much more at the same time, we're pushing each other away in a way that we're never yeah. able to really like understand that the commonalities among us. And so, you know, I, I guess I wish that that was an, an experience and a feeling that more people had knowing um, that we do all share a lot of commonalities, even 
among people who seem very different from us. Absolutely. We have way more in common than we have differences, but we somehow focus on the differences, don't we? So I feel like that's something we need to get through is, you know, focusing our com- on our commonalities and, and the similarities between us. I mean, it doesn't matter where you're from, what race you are, where, you know, how you grew up. We have so much more in common than we have difference. And I was explaining that actually to, to a group of people today when they were asking about the podcast, I said, you know, the reason I, I, do this podcast, I said, not everybody can be successful, but we have all experienced challenges. And so, you know, talking about the challenges is the commonality. That's, that's, that's the common ground. We have all experienced incredible challenges and we have all had to, you know, kind of grind through things that really just are devastating and, and beat us down. And that is the commonality. That is, that is our common ground. And if we can focus on that, that relates us, right? That we are connected. Wow. And so not while while not everybody has experienced tremendous success, we have all experienced tremendous heartache and tremendous loss. Mm. And, and that is our commonality, right? And so that's why I kind of bring up some things that are challenging, you know, talk about some challenges because that's the that's where connected. That's where the connection happens, right? So anyway. Oh, that's absolutely beautiful and well said. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Our I failures, our failures unite us. Yeah, for sure. For sure. I mean, that's the one thing that we've all been through, right? Like nobody has come out and be like, life has been fantastic. I've never experienced anything bad. I don't know what you're talking about. Like, okay. (laughs) Whatever. (laughs) So yeah. Never been rejected. Never, 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 never. (laughs) Never been embarrassed. Mm -hmm. Nope. So, well, I really, really, really enjoyed our conversation. I have just loved talking with you and I've gained so much insight and I just applaud you and wish you incredible success in what you're doing. And I, I, I know that if anyone can help make this 2%, 25%, it's you. So, um, (laughs) so I know, I know you are on the right track and we've got the right person, you know, kind of looking out for, for our, our funding internationally. So thank you so much for all that you do. Oh, well, thank you. And, and for your listeners and, and for this fantastic podcast. And um, I look forward yeah. to hearing many more of your interviewees. Absolutely. Well, thank you guys so much for joining us for another episode of the Pretty Powerful Podcast. And thank you to to Martha for joining us um, again. And, and if you want to find out more about her, please go to prettypowerfulpodcast.com. And she will uh, all of her links will be there as well. And um, I will make sure that there is a link to NGO source so that people can check out that as well. So thank you again, Martha Lackford's Peltier, and I uh, hope everyone has an amazing day. Thank you for joining our guests on the Pretty Powerful Podcast. And we hope you've gained new insight and learn from exceptional women. Remember to subscribe or check out this and all episodes on prettypowerfulpodcast.com. Visit us next time, and until then, step into your own power.